Today we have David Lim here, he's also a friend of mine, and we will be talking a little bit about construction laws, litigation, legality part of things, and David has been helpful with some of my projects, and he does M&A, mm. a lot of um, shareholding matters in oil and gas, um, online social media platform, also construction, right? Yes. So perhaps you could have a little bit more of a brief introduction of what you do and what you want people to know you as. Right. Um, I think mainly I, I do corporate matters. So that uh, is mergers, acquisition, joint venture, all, all sort of corporate commercial agreements, you know, supply, distribution, licensing, franchising. And um, of course, I also try my best to advise my clients across uh, all the practical things that they encounter during their business. Right. So, for example, you know, of course, a business, we do not hope it goes there, but, you know, there might be time where they need advice on disputes or potential disputes that they'll be having. So I'm trying to give a more 360 kind of uh, legal advisory for my clients. And that's kind of like how we came across each other mm, when you mm, had mm, a, a potential dispute or rather a dispute already at that time. Right. Yeah. So I think um, all in all, uh, corporate lawyer David Lim. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So I think let's start off with um, how we got to know each other. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, is that it came at the right time, but not a good start, right? For my business, especially because uh, we were we were owed by some clients some money, and then that's where you came in. So then that's we had a situation. A brief situation like just a recap la, what happened mm. and then we can dive into it how you make the decision behind what you you do what you what you do la, what you did there okay so firstly we were owed um a sum of about 1.2 million two years ago and we we're in construction and we already completed the entire project then you came to advise gave to came to give me a certain set of advice. I was torn between the idea of doing SIPA because that's something new to me and that's also straight up litigation. And to add on to it, in my contract with the client, I had this whole thing called arbitration clause, right? So would you mind taking from there how how you process this whole situation and why you make this call? Yeah, yeah, sure. I think, um, uh, you mentioned uh, the concept of SIPA, right? So it's just for the benefit of you know whoever's listening in. SIPA uh, means um, an, it's an act, right, by the government that provides for uh, for the dispute to be resolved via adjudication. Uh, and you also pointed out arbitration and um, and how it's up at how SIPA feels like it's litigation, right? But I think in the in the mind of a lawyer, um, those three cons. Those three methods are totally different from each other, mm. right? So if we start with adjudication, adjudication means you submit uh, the dispute at hand to an expert who's an adjudicator, and they adjudicate on the matter uh, and provide a decision on that, right? Whereas arbitration, quite similar to um, adjudication, again, you submit to either one expert or a panel expert, right? And mm. then uh, you go to arbitration center, uh, it's more private, it's more confidential, and you also get, um, uh, if your dispute is related to construction, you can get a particular expert on construction to arbitrate on the matter. And then lastly, of course, we're talking about litigation, which is you go to the Malaysian courts, right? And of course, um, for the courts, it's it's based on quite random assignment, right? You may, there are specialist uh, construction court, but uh, in general, when you go to court, you don't really get to choose whether there's an expert that, that um, comes from your matter. Now, um, how the thought process uh, when you came to me, uh, of course, I look at the contract and I, and, and I saw that there's an arbitration clause, which means that um, probably going to court wasn't an op option, right? Because you have technically agreed in the contract for your dispute to be submitted to arbitration. So, which means what you're you're saying is that if there's an arbitration clause, um, it 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 holds me from moving to to litigation. Is uh, that what you mean? In a way, yes, because you have actually agreed 
for arbitration to be uh, the way you resolve your dispute. Okay. Right? So um, we have an arbitration act in Malaysia and once you have agreed in your contract for it to be submitted to arbitration, if you end up starting a dispute, um, there is uh, an argument that can be taken to, to, to suspend the dispute at the court and then bring it to arbitration. Mm. Yeah. So if if there's arbitration clause, then of course we wouldn't advise our client to go for uh, litigation anymore because you know the eventuality is that it will still be suspended and then transferred to arbitration as the proper forum as you call it. Mm. Yeah. Whereas um in in your case we were looking at adjudication as a a quicker method, right? Because notwithstanding that you have arbitration as the the sort of the final way to solve to resolve the dispute, um, the route of adjudication is always there, because the whole basis of adjudication is that it's quick, uh, you get the expert to hear it, and um, the idea was to reduce this whole delay uh, mm. in, in payment in the construction uh, industry, right? Where maybe the main contractor is uh, holding off payment to the subcontractor, causing further delays to the project. So the whole purpose of SIPA really was uh, you know, grounded in a very uh, simple concept that is uh, mentioned in a few of the judgment, which is uh, pay first, argue later. Right. Yeah. So which means even, um, let's say, in through a construction, there are four progress payments. If the second progress payment is late, I can also submit for SIPA. Sure. And continue with the construction. Yes. Yeah. So it's it's at every single milestone, every single uh, payment phase, if there is a a dispute, right? I mean, which arise right from a construction, may maybe from the con the subcontractor side um saying that hey, work is done, you know, you payment should be made. And the main contractor or the developer itself saying that hey, you know, there are defects that you need to remedy. So there are various kind of dispute, but the whole point of this um, mechanism, right, mm. adjudication is that um, let's both submit our documentation to adjudicator and let the expert decide on the matter. And then if the expert decides in favor of one party, then we move on, mm. right? We, we move on with the payment. And then if you really feel like, hey, you want to take it a little bit further, then depending on your contract, mm. you can take it to arbitration or you can take it to the court. Okay, so there are a couple of few uh, questions I would mm. want to go with. Lars. Okay, so now in this discussion, right, I don't see ourselves like, okay, standing on the side of contractor, subcontractor, client, or even developer. Let's make this as neutral as possible, right? What is the main thing that all parties should take note of to avoid this from happening? Or if it happens, what would be the main basis of um, argument? Just now you mentioned documentation, right? Mm. Um, you might elaborate thing more like, if I can again, what exactly I need to focus on? Sure. I, I think, um, so going back to the, the, the idea of documentation, of course, uh, number one is um, for between the contractors and, and, and the developers. I mean, any party, right? I mean, the contract is the basis of everything, that four corner of the contract. So um, to, to prevent this from happening, uh, or rather to reduce the, the impact, I yes, would say. Yeah, reducing impact. Yeah, I won't say you can totally avoid this, but to reduce the impact, you obviously have to have a good a, a set of agreement, right? Which sets out very clearly what are the obligation, obligations of each party. Mm. And I think one part that um, maybe uh, is not looked at very closely is let's just say there is a delay, right? And okay. the clauses on delay needs to be clear about, okay, if there's a delay, who needs to notify? Uh, so let's say the subcontractor needs to notify the main contractor that there's a delay. Now, what's the timeline? What is that notice going to look like, right? Most of the time, it's, 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 it's there somewhere in the agreement. Mm -hmm. It may not be fully set out, but everyone just kind of like forget about it and yeah. do it verbally via WhatsApp. Via so speaking of WhatsApp, is that a pow uh, powerful enough of a tool to be used as documentation? It is, it is recognized as evidence in the court, right? But then if WhatsApp wasn't the prescribed way of giving notice mm. 
in the uh, agreement, then you will have a tough time because then again, it's an open point that you have to argue about, mm. right? And if we submit to an expert or even if we, we go to court or arbitration eventually, then it's an additional point that you need to kind of argue about and prove who has a stronger case. Whereas if you're very clear that, okay, clause 5.1 says you need to give a written notice via email, then you give a written notice via email. It mm. says you need to give a notice within five days of such delay occurring. Then you give it within five days. Then you have a stronger case, right? Mm. So couple that with uh, strong documentation. You know, when we say contract must be coupled with the progress uh, report. Um, I, think every, I think everyone in the industry uh, understand the, the importance of uh, progress report. Uh, if there's a variation, there must be proper variation order. Uh, but at the same time, most, uh, I would say in most cases when we see there are dispute, uh, there's always a bit of uh, carelessness, I would mm. say, or rather uh, a little bit too much trust on, trust. The, on the other party. Uh, you know, maybe it was a verbal kind of exchange okay. where they're like, oh, don't worry, uh, we may not sign your progress report now, but we will do it eventually, just start first. And then I'll sort it out later. So, uh, of course, when nothing happens, everybody is happy and kumbaya, right? But then when a dispute happens, then you start looking back at this documentation and you realize that, hey, there's actually gaps here. Mm. And that essentially translates to your case being a weaker case. Mm -hmm. And the, the quantum you're going to get as well may not be the full quantum that you, you, you have in mind. Mm. Let's put it in like a much more um, a simplified formula. Let's say, be it if I were to be a contractor, a subcontractor, or even a client, what would be that point of trigger where I could actually look to submit SIPA? So for instance, we always get caught in this um, deadlock of, let's say you are the client, I'm the contractor, and be like, you pay me late mm. because your justification is that you don't see the work progress to the milestone and I choose not to continue the progress work meaning stop work la. so that's pretty much what all contractors would do mm. oh, stop work stop work as a form of like threatening yeah. and then when that happens right what would you see could be a better way out of this situation yeah um, I think if it was up to me um my advice would be um, both parties uh, put in uh, certain documentation. Of course, from the contractor side, you could you could give evidence of where the progress is, right? And um, from even the client side, they, they could take a picture, you know, you know, if it's a more lay client, they can take a picture and, and sort of um, show that, hey, you actually not done the job up to, up to that point that you're talking about. But I think ultimately, <clears throat> we when we look at disputes, right, there are two polarizing positions. Uh, one will always say that I've done the work. One will say, no, you've not done the work enough or not done it uh, good enough, mm. right? And and it's really hard to, to, to marry the both um, and try to make both see a common solution. If there's a common solution, then there won't be a dispute. So ultimately, it's probably easier to just uh, be clear about okay if there is any form of um, kind of uh, disagreement on the progress can we bring in a third party an independent person that both parties agree on at the start uh, of course that that's normally uh, when we see in Malaysia is the architect right the architect to come and verify it could be that it could be uh, uh, now there's a lot of uh, inspection expert Right. right, they can come in and inspect, right? Uh, but if those two methods don't work, then, you know, without hard feelings, just say, look, if we can't agree on it, why don't we just submit it to the dispute to an expert adjudicator? If it's a substantial enough amount, let's submit it, but then I tell you what, let's continue with the rest and then let this be resolved through the proper mechanism, right? Rather than... Um, spending a lot of uh, frustr uh, time and frustration, right? And and of course, you know, as you, you pointed out, right, if the contractors suspend work because 
uh, the, the contractor didn't feel like they, they get the, the payment that they're supposed to get. Then the contractor also run the risk of um, being in breach of the contract. Yeah, exactly. So the whole idea is that some contractors or some builders don't even know whether doing this is a rightful thing to do or not. Because like what you say, a breach of contract, right? But yeah. then continuing the job is also potentially not possible because of the financial risk. That's right. That's why I think um, rather than, than, than taking matter into your own hands and then uh, giving more ammunition later on for someone to say, hey, you are in the wrong as well, mm. right? So I think, uh, you know, kind of prevention is better than cure. That, mm, that, mm. that always ring true uh, whenever it comes to a construction dispute, right? Be, which is that you have to kind of stem it early, right? And if you, you find that there's already a issue, then uh, document it, you know, have it all in writing early as possible. Uh, and then from there on, really um, try to resolve it then. Lah. But, it, it, you know, what's worrying sometimes is uh, the, the, the kind of self-remedy lah, that people take, mm, mm. right? And then later on, it causes more tr- uh, problem when we are trying to build the case, right? right? Um, because, you know, it's not just the contractor, right? It, it could also be the, the owner themselves saying, hey, I'm going to not pay, right? But then, uh, you know, on, on what basis, right? But if you, if you pay what you are not disputing, then you are also not running the risk of breaching the, the, the same mm. thing. So I think it goes both ways. Uh, but I think the, 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 the mature way or the, the, the right way is uh, both parties to kind of compartmentalize. Hey, this, this particular milestone, we are, we, are dis- we are having a dispute. Let's compartmentalize. Let, let's submit this to a third party. Mm. And then we continue with the rest so that the rest of the agreement or the rest of the, the progress uh, remain intact. And, you know, you won't have an issue later on. No, I really like how you put it because I think uh, from our point of view, when we are so into the moment, right, things get heated up and then the, the, it gets really tense to a point that he's not replying. He's not re- t- picking up my call. What should I do next? Okay. Obviously, the what should I do next is, has always been in our head whether we should issue an LOD, uh, LOD or or how many more notifications should I issue him personally from a, a company's point of view before I reach out to the lawyer. And it's quite nice lah, that you put it in a way that it could be resolved from a third party point of view and then let's just de-escalate this whole situation, right? So um, say for instance, let's say if I realize that this person is, has delayed my progress payment for almost two months, would you say that could be a way to go LOD first? If LOD is not responded to, then there'll be another crossroad of determining whether it's a SIPA or arbitration, would you say so? Just yeah. to shorten the entire process as a summary, like yeah. what we've discussed. Yeah, for sure. I think um, as, as a start, the LOD or notice must should be given to the mm. other party. Mm. And, um, you know, for us, we, we, we would say that, hey, you should set out your case, right? Mm. Basically, have the documentation with your LOD. Don't just send a, a LOD and say, hey, you owe me this, this amount. I've done the work. You need to pay me. But mm. really put in the documentation as well. Now, uh, even with LOD, um, you can give them seven days to reply to that, right? Uh, if they need more time, they will say they need more time. Mm. But give seven days and if let's say in seven days there's no reply or the reply is not satisfactory then commence the, the, the process right and I think the the, the the beauty of adjudication is the the timeline right yeah um, but at the same time we also f- uh, find ourselves in situations where uh, the client end up spending more time deciding about the adjudication absolutely right. i think that that you're that's me you're talking about like <laughs> i think i've pretty much spent almost eight months deciding on that and, for myself yeah and whereas the, the the process itself takes about 85 to 90 working days so um we do find that clients uh, spend as much time thinking about it than the process itself mm. right whereas um if we can all uh, as you as you correctly pointed out we de-escalate uh take ourselves out of it and say hey this is a problem in itself Right, this is just one portion of the project. Let's 
deal with it um, you know outside of the rest of the project then um, in a way you know you 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 do kind of save yourself from the unnecessary trouble later on which I, I'm sure we can talk about it more like, yeah. you know for example like uh, liquidated damages for delay mm. um, and then you know how the fact that you have certain retention sum with them and how that all plays out if in the middle of the project there is a issue and you do not resolve it quick enough Mm. To summarize kind of what we spoke about, I think end of the day, we are very much concerned about the monetary terms, the collection, the payment, right? But from your point of view, dealing with so many different type of cases, what would you say the mitigation strategy should be? Let's say if you would advise me as a construction company or, or a design consultancy firm, what exactly do you think I should look out for before you know any of these will happen? I would say contract would be one of it, right? Yeah. But how how detailed should it get, right? What are the things that we should cover that you know people might be caught uh, blindsided? I think there are, there are there are two things like One, of course, the contract is the starting point, yep. right? And uh, I think uh, uh, maybe uh, the industry just needs to 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 kind of invest you know i would say um, the word invest right invest in a good set of uh, design and build contract mm -hmm. right uh that is modeled uh based on good good templates such as the pam contract um if you're talking about international standard that's the fidic contracts right uh philip yeah fidic fidic how do you spell yeah, it f-i-d-i-c f-i-d-i-c yeah, but these are normally used for bigger infrastructure projects uh, but for local PEM contract, which is the contract that is uh, issued by the Persatuan Architect Malaysia, yeah. right? That's a good starting point. Uh, it should cover the, the different contingencies and it also gives a more standardized terms for like damages and, and what happens if certain uh, events happen, right? How do we resolve the, the, the conflict and all that? So I think that's number one, right? Invest in a, in a good set of contracts, you know, you can use it later on for your other projects. But number two, after you have a good contract, uh, there is no point if you do not project manage mm. according to the contract. Now, I think this is something that um, perhaps uh, is kind of overlooked, in my opinion, is that uh, in the bus of getting multiple projects done, in the bus of uh, the busyness of, 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 of you know, dealing with all the different uh, subcontractors, suppliers, vendors, mm. um, and also meeting your clients' demands. Um, really, um, uh, are, are there a, a sufficient project management uh, to to make sure that your clients sign off on everything? Right. I, I know it's it's painful, and sometimes you may feel. I think also because uh, you know maybe just the Malaysian and Asian culture right mm. is that uh, we don't want to uh, make things too difficult for our client exactly right? yeah we don't want to kind of be like hey uh, we've done this please sign we've done this please sign mm -hmm. right but i think uh, it's important to 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 be very clear uh, right from the start that this is how we're going to do it and the project manager or the supervisor needs to understand that this is important for the for the company right for that project to ensure, uh, uh, you know, a good completion, and there, there to be not no dispute. I think uh, what we do find is that um, when we actually dig deeper into the documentation and the progress and asking questions, uh, then uh, we find that hey, maybe the project wasn't managed as as well as it should. But I mean, can't really blame the the individuals as well because I think. Um, the, the company needs to set the expectation and really follow through and be like, hey, if this is not signed off, then we can't go to the next phase, right? And and just insist on that every single time. Yeah. So would you say this is one of like the largest downfall of most documentation to litigation to... Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, arbitration and all. 100%. 100%. I mean, uh, whatever the scale of the project is, I think uh, the biggest downfall is, is the lack of, um, I would say, active project management. Active. Yeah. Uh, not 
when things are done, uh, or or when issues starts arising or disputes start arising, then then you're like, oh, okay, now please sign this document because I need to prove that I've mm. I've done my job, right? So uh, obviously belatedly, uh, if you do it belatedly, then then there might be some resistance, right? Because yeah. people know, the, the the counterpart knows that you're trying to now. Uh, kind of catch me in this situation, right? Yeah, uh, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So, but if you do it like as a part of your SOP that you that is in the, and and is provided in a the contract, then there there shouldn't be any resistance to it. You know? Even with the means of jeopardizing the timeline, because that's always the you know the chicken and egg thing that I haven't gotten this paper done. But at the same time, we are chasing for like a twenty five day uh, timeline period of construction. Sure, I I, I think. Yeah, but that is also the balancing exercise, right? If you if you don't get this part done well, and I think as as Lena, you know, uh, the cost of mm. rectifying it or or rather going to dispute later right. is probably a lot higher than 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 you know just waiting out for that 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 process to be done properly, mm, right? Mm, Before mm. you go into the next milestone, so that you can collect the payment for the next milestone. Mm. So. In terms of that, I think uh, proper project management is, is, is still what I would advise. Hmm. And to have a, a project manager or supervisor who will make sure that all these things are done and then you, you get a nice folder, you know, like for us as lawyers as well, we, if we see a nice folder with everything signed and everything is complete, hmm. uh, then we know that, hey, this is a surefire case, right? We, we know we have a good case. And, and in terms of the the client as well we can tell them that hey you can expect a higher quantum because your documentation is complete mm, 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 and it's it, the project is managed well yeah mm, mm, and i think it also if if the, the the other side sees that it's being managed well uh the likelihood of them trying to claim for something is is lower as well right, right? or to try to deduct for liquidated damages is is a lot lower the risk Mm-hmm. You know, like uh, there are many projects sometimes as clients themselves, right, uh, would like to expand on outlets, brands, whether it's a restaurant, um, a sports center or whatnot. So they're going to be either renting a place, purchasing a land to build something up. And that's where they start gathering um, different consultants, contractors, subcontractors, and tie it into a team. And I don't often see the presence of a lawyer to kind of put this tie in place, you know, put them in a really nice bucket where everyone can work harmoniously and bounded by a certain contract. Most of the time, it's just the client himself would be like holding the flag, spearheading the entire thing and making sure everyone does their job. Do you, have you ever seen problems like that or do you see problems arising from that? That Even if, let's say, I were to be one of those consultants in the bucket that I should take note of. Because I have to deal with so many different parties. Yeah, I think I think um, the the situation that you have pointed out is where there is no main contractor or there's no there's no main contractor. There's no turnkey contractor to basically manage everyone. Absolutely. Now, um, in 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 such situation, the the difficulty is, um, for example, if you're you're one of the consultant, um, you and you have to do let's just say painting job, right? Um, obviously you have promised the client a certain timeline where you get it done but then you go into the site and then the, the guy that's doing the wall uh, is not done correct yeah and you're waiting for, for that, that that contractor to be done and, and um, again you, you, you run the risk of being in, in, in breach of your own contract mm. and then I will be part of the responsible responsibility to the LAD Correct, correct. Right. Yeah, so I, I think um, in such situation, um, what the, the all the subcontractors could do is um, maybe um, if, if it's possible to, 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 to get everyone to have a clause in their, their agreement with the client to say that, hey, if, if there is a collective delay, Right, or there's a delay of the contractor that's meant to do a certain part of the work before me, then I get an extension of time automatically. Right? Mm, mm, mm. Where, uh, rather than everyone agree to a certain timeline that is set uh, probably by the client at the start, right? 
and then after that be in risk of, of breaching it and sort of arguing with each other and also arguing with the client because ultimately if everyone enters into their own contract with the client then uh, the liability is separate right the responsibility is separate from each other mm. so you can't really say that because the last guy was not fast enough or didn't do their job properly then I should not be responsible right but the more important thing is can I get extension of time mm. right if the the last person that's meant to do the job um, have not done their part yet mm. so I think that that's something to keep in mind that you want to if you know that you're going to be part of this uh, project where there are multiple consultants multiple contractors uh, and you know that your work depends on them getting their work done then maybe you want to you know request specifically that hey I want an extension of time clause in there if there is a delay by the other contractor mm. which will impact my timeline mm. so that brings me to the next point of like what I want to know about this thing I learned throughout this this time period working with you back then is bespoke contract right so there's PAM contract that you mentioned and it's something that is pretty much standardized for the industry but then there's also bespoke contract of which you and I work on a project and I issue you a, a LA based on the terms that protects my interests then where do you come in picture obviously we can work out a draft and then work out something that we both can agree on but how strong is this bespoke contract and should it be STEM or how does it get exercised in the legal terms in Malaysia? Well, I think um, if you are talking about uh, most uh, contractors that we see, they sign a letter of award and that becomes the contract itself, right? Um, or they would, they would sign a more simple letter of awards and they will say that the terms and condition will be in the agreement to be, to mm. be signed, mm. right? Uh, what's uh, risky or scary sometimes is uh, they kind of just stop at the letter or what and they never went any further than What that. do you mean? like? Meaning, uh, you know, I think for the contractors, they are more concerned about the payment milestones and the timeline, right? Okay. So then it's sort of like, okay, this is the project, this is the payment milestones, this is the timeline. Then they, they, they don't go further into entering the agreement that sets up what are the obligations and all those things that I mentioned earlier. Mm. Uh, what happens if uh, there is a delay? What are the notices? What are the delay events which will allow me to get an automatic extension of time? Right? Mm. So I think that in general, you, you, you do need uh, where, where our involvement should come in uh, even at the issuance of the letter of what because the, mm. the, the okay. terms of the letter of what should be a very condensed and summarized version of the bigger agreement or if you choose not to have the, the, the more comprehensive agreement then the letter of what should then cover. cover a lot of things right um, and um, I, I, I know you mentioned that, that, that template is template but um, in fact I think that you know for us when we say bespoke we still try to look at the good parts of the template right that we can okay. we can incorporate and the, the, the good part about using uh, a template uh, the clauses from template is that people are, are aware of what it's gonna say and uh, there's there is um, a lower uh, chance that they will say hey I don't like this clause because uh, right. or you're trying to 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 to, to kind of uh, put this clause uh, in your interest only. Right? It's kind of like most of the SMP agreement. Yeah, if yeah. it's standardized, people will exactly, question it. Like. Exactly. Yeah, like the housing kind, right? You mm. just sign it because you kind of know that hey, everyone's signing the same thing, right? But so I mean, it does make uh, the the negotiation a lot easier, and uh, depending on the, the project value, right? If it's a very high project value, and 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 they 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 may not want to spend months just arguing about. The, the terms, mm. right? Although we want to be, make it a bit more bespoke to just um, cater for the, the, the uniqueness of the, the contract, right? Maybe you're, you're, you're building a, 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 a office tower, then there are certain requirements that might be mm. in there as opposed to just a, a simple like uh, residential or simple retail lot, right? Mm -hmm. So all those can be, can be sort of uh, incorporated, but I think yeah, like the the, the starting point is um, 
we you need a contract which reflects or a letter of award which reflects the actual project, right? Uh, no one project is is the same. It's the same, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, things like where where is the project located is 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 a is a big factor, right? Mm-hmm. Um, is it a a type of project where they they want certain materials, certain requirements or specifications as well? I mean, um, it you you can't templateize these things, mm-hmm. right? And you need to cater for for it, and I think um, uh you don't even need the lawyers to be redoing the whole thing but just share with them like hey this is what i think is the unique feature of the 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 project do you think i need to include something to um cater for this right right like for example your client may say i want this wood from a particular country right mm. and this is not something that's really in your control right if you were to bring in a mm. material that is that's overseas, uh, the delivery time, the installation, and all that stuff that might be delayed, but it's out of your control. Mm. So then you will want to put that as oh, if there's a delay because of this, then it's actually automatic extension. But if you just take a, a normal contract, you you would take responsibility for that, right? If it's not within the timeline. And you are you are you are not entitled to extension of time. Then that's it. You breach the mm-hmm. contract. Yeah. Understand. So when you mentioned just now, that's where you come in from the start of engagement with the client, trying to understand what's the special part about this project, the details of it before we formulate the LA and next the contract, and then hopefully there are also services that way you can just stick around until. Like so called, um, because sometimes you follow through the contract, but sometimes through the progress payment, there will be problems. That's also something that you can look into as well, lah. Yeah. So what what we do for our our client is that we 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 go with them from the start, right? So as you correctly point out, the during the letter or what, uh, even during the preparation of letter or what. The agreement, and most importantly, during the construction period, right? Mm-hmm. And after, even after the construction period, there's a defects liability period. Yeah. If, if it's there, or remedy period, we call it. Um, I think that's always the the problem that we face because the whole defects liability period is say six months, twelve months, twenty four months, right? What falls under that period? We can say it's wear and tear. Some might say is no, it's 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 a uh, faulty equipment. So that's always the gray part that we couldn't. Yeah, exactly. Right yeah, now. yeah. So I think this comes back to the the how how well do you know the terms in your contract, right? Right. Yeah. So I think um, <clears throat> if you know, uh, how the 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 term is being drafted, uh, then you you can kind of make a determination of whether that falls under a defect or not, mm. right? But if if you just use the word defect quite generally, then mm. it's a bit it then it's a it's an open can mm-hmm. of worm for you mm-hmm. to really mm-hmm. argue. So, what is helpful uh by having a, a a sort of a legal counsel from the start is that, um, at every point, we understand and we know exactly what's in there. Mm. So, uh, after the agreement is signed during the construction period, if there is any dis any kind of uh, dispute, uh, then we can revisit and we know exactly what is in the agreement to mm. to advise the client that hey, actually, uh, what they are saying is valid because sometimes between mm-hmm. clients is is more about how I feel and how you feel, mm. uh, my perspective versus yours, right? Yeah. Whereas, uh, for us, we will go back to the actual four corner of the contract and be like, okay, the language says uh, this, so what they're asking for is valid. Even if, you know, it may not be uh, what you want as a client, but at least we, we can, can advise you accordingly and you won't be saying no just because you didn't feel that way. Understand. Yeah. yeah. And then during the defense liability period as well, um, if there's an issue that is brought up, you can also kind of uh, pass it on to us and be like, hey, is this, uh, is what they're asking for? Is it is it wear and tear? Or is it is it actually mm. defects, right? And then we can do that analysis based on the, mm. the the contract for you. But having that 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 continuity is important because the the it's the same people who who were there from the start, mm. um, all the way until the end. 
So that's what we try to recommend to our client. Mm. And it's not to say that like, hey, you pay us continuously for for the next one year, two years, depending on how long your, your contract period is. It's, it's more of the fact that um, there is, we, we charge you for the contract, but you, you also can come to us when there's issue and we can agree on a rate whenever such issue Understand. arises. And um, all in all, if you, if this whole project management uh, engagement is done properly, then hopefully, although it's a higher upfront cost, mm. hopefully it saves you the cost of having to go through a litigation. Yep, yep. Yeah. Yep. So I think let's cover a little bit about other a more um, business related matters like because i understand you do a lot of m and a um there's dilution of shares and whatnot so what are the main thing you look into when you deal with m and a whether it's a, a subsidiary company that comes into it so for instance let's say we are doing a construction company and we want to open a carpentry um, factory should it be under and then what's what's the what's the process like looking into um, this kind of uh, stuff that you do yeah i think i think for us uh firstly um, we will ask the about the individuals you know because individuals make the company right yeah. the founders and i think the the first thing we will ask is okay what's your objective for example in in the example that you gave uh, if you want to open a carpentry arm as a subsidiary, uh, it might be a hobby, it might be a different revenue stream, right? It might, uh, and we say, when we say a different revenue stream, maybe uh, let's just say your your current company is doing pretty good and you just want to diversify. Yeah, right? diversification has always yeah. been a thing. So if that is the case, then uh, of course, uh, if we understand that, then it means that okay, then this um, carpentry arm will be a subsidiary, should be a subsidiary, mm-hmm. right? Because it's it sort of uh, shows a good story, right? That you, you know, now you've done constru- uh, this particular cons- uh, ID consultancy construction, and then now you have a carpentry arm. Uh, and, you know, for some clients who their ultimate goal is IPO, right. that, that also plays into it, right? Whereas um, if you say, oh, this is a pure passion project uh, I don't think it's going to make that much money uh, so I want to keep it rather separate from from the main business then we'll say okay then maybe it's not ideal for it to be a uh, subsidiary right but I think ultimately these are a bit legal but also more business kind of mm. considerations from a legal perspective yes. um, for us it's more of uh, the structuring um like do, do are you gonna have other shareholders uh do we need a shareholder agreement for you to govern the rights are you going to this as a jv or you know you want to fully own it um those are the things that we are, we are really more um, zooming in more right so but, to clarify when you mentioned those things right so for instance let's say i my partner and i are running this company and we have investment coming in so the investment comes in doesn't necessarily translate into the company share would you also say so that could be in the form of like um non-working yeah, investment yeah, yeah there'll be dividends or whatnot yeah sure i mean um investment coming in um you can have it as uh what we call preference shares right. yeah so preference shares are basically uh shares where you have a fixed um return so it, it works a bit like a, a, a bit like a loan right where where there's an eight percent fixed return and then uh, after x amount of years the company can redeem basically redeem all the shares means paying back so let's say you your, your investor comes in they may not want to take a uh, what we call ordinary share right which has uh, controlling rights in the company they may say hey Leonard, i think you're doing a fantastic job i just want to invest and i want to get a financial return so they may come in uh, and just put a 8%, 10%, 12% uh, preference shares. After five years, the company makes money, the company redeems it. Uh, they've been happily getting their 10 or 12% for the last five years. Mm. And then they, they exit at the end of it. Right. Right. Or 
depending on the investor, they might be like, hey, I think there is an angle here where if we are shareholder, ordinary shareholder, uh, it could be a strategic investor, <clears throat> then they might want to come as an ordinary shareholder, be part of the management, you mm. know, see how they can help you boost your business. So there's different ways. Uh, not necessarily, like you said, has to be shares, but I think most of the time, um, the investment do come in the form of uh, shares may not be the mm -hmm. shares that we are all thinking about but nevertheless uh, that is the most common instrument we call it right uh, and also because it guarant it kind of protects your rights the most as an investor as opposed to let's just say um, I come to you and say I, I like your business I'm going to give you money um, you just treat me as a creditor but mm. as a creditor if you don't pay me then your company winds up mm. then I don't get much mm. I only get whatever the company uh, is valued at yeah or, yeah, or, or, or whatever asset that you have right yep. or I might not even get anything at all if the company has like negative asset right so at least as a shareholder I, I, I if the company goes winding up uh, at least I have a say mm -hmm. I have a, a way to kind of protect my interest mm. this would be very much different from like um, angel investors startups they have their own different set of uh, structure. Do you say so? Uh, I would I would say it's quite similar. Yeah. The, uh, I mean, angel investor is and and startups generally how they, they start is um you know like I have a great idea, I get my I get my friends and family mm -hmm. put in one hundred thousand each. Uh, could be shares or uh, again it could be the preference shares route that we're talking about uh, sometimes um, they, they they put in the money mm -hmm. and then it can be converted into shares in future as well mm -hmm. um, it's, it's actually the same thing I think people people think that like oh like startups and all this is, is somewhat different but um, I think the, the core of it uh, is, is still investment in the form of uh, security la, or equity we call it mm. yeah i see i see yeah so i think of course when we get a more sufficient money to invest in other business that's where you come in la, to help us la. because i think diversification is also something that of course in the long run that's what we were looking at could be fnb and as a construction company where do we position ourselves to strategically grow another business say a friend who's looking to expand their fnb Oh, of course, there's something that uh, we don't mind looking into as well. Yeah, it's to understand more of like the things you do. Because I also understand that you have a case um, where you did some share allocations for a cosmetic company. Like that, that caught my attention a bit as to how that thing actually functions. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I... I Ultimately, uh, for for a corporate lawyer, we we are here to to advise you on the um, arrangement you would have, right? So, for example, if you if you want to invest in F and B business, then how is that arrangement gonna look like? Mm. What are the um, shareholding? What are your the decision making um, that that you will be having, lah, right? So, depending again, coming back to 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 the objective, right? Um, if your objective is to just put money in and then sit back, mm -hmm. then the 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 terms in the agreement will look very different. Mm -hmm. If your your you tell me that your objective is to be actively involved in the business, then the the terms will obviously have a lot more management rights in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think one thing that I really try to do with all my clients is really to sit down and talk to them, and just be very uh, open about what they want mm. out of it because sometimes uh, what's said on paper or it may not translate right mm -hmm. um, for example I, 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 I like I, I, lo I love coffee right and and maybe one day I'll invest in a, in a cafe right mm. uh, and I have to ask myself right do Am I interested to go and uh, make coffee myself mm. and, and, and to really be there to, to, to run the cafe? Or do I like the fact that I'm just going to put some money there and then I'm going to turn up and drink coffee all the time for mm -hmm. free? 
So that's two different scenarios, right? Uh, but maybe uh, on, on, on paper, it would just look like I want to invest X amount and, and, and like, you know, I just want to be be there. And, and, and I think sometimes... The involvement. Yeah, the degree of involvement. So it's people, people always feel like, oh, if you put money then, or you invest in something, then that means you want to be very involved. Mm. Right? But that's not necessarily the case. Mm. Right? Uh, or they see that, oh, every investor would want to have absolute rights. Yep. So then they, they try to skew the, 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 the agreements to be very pro-investor. Um, and that ultimately causes a lot of friction between the, the people who are running the operation and the investor, right? Mm. And then uh, the, the management will eventually get frustrated and then wants to buy out the investor. Right. Which is something that we, we don't really wish to see uh, because this is something that we can we can really work out from the start. So that's something that you, you will be heavily uh, involved in in terms of drafting this whole uh, memorandum of understanding or how you yeah, call it, right? Yeah. So it, it goes back to like what I'm trying to achieve to to be part of this business. And maybe I can also offer you like scenario-based um, situations. Yeah, would you say for so? sure, for sure. Uh, I think, I think the, 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 the legal clauses are in our head or rather already in our knowledge, right? right? Yeah, but I think the the, 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 the the difficulty or the gap sometimes between the clients and the, the lawyers is that, hey, we're speaking in this like alien language sometimes. Mm. And we're just like, hey, this is your your joint venture agreement or shareholder agreement. Please take a look. Let me know if you have any comments. Yeah. And uh, half the time the client's like, I don't have any comments because I don't know what yeah. you're trying to say here, right? Um, which... What we try to do, uh, which, you know, kind of just a very simple example is that we'll ask the client, do you want to um, have control of the company or you're quite happy to share it? And the client will say, um, I'm quite happy to share the, 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 the control. So then in terms of the, the actual clauses, then we'll, it, will, it will translate to um, the client having... Uh, two directors you can nominate two directors the other guy can nominate two directors so then that's a, in a way sharing control All right. or if we, if we say oh um, okay you want to share control but uh, if anything happens you want to have the last say so then the client will say mm, yeah that's what I want and that would translate to the client having uh, what we call a list of uh, reserve matters right uh, and reserve matters are matters which are important that ultimately you need that one shareholder to say yes to mm. in order for it to proceed. For example, if for the client it's like, oh, I don't want the company to go and simply take loan. So then we'll put that as a reserve matter. If the right. company wants to take any loan, they must get this shareholder's approval. Mm. So there are there are always different different scenarios that we can cater for mm. in the in the in the agreement. But ultimately it comes back to what is the intention. Right of the, the 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 individual, right. If not, uh, then it's just a very soulless um agreement, mm. right? Where, uh, where you no, know, that, that's why we get a lot of uh, inquiries and say, oh, this one just a template, right? You can just uh prepare it in five minutes, right? Mm-hmm. But um, we don't want to prepare soulless templates. We actually want to understand, uh, the client's intention, the client's business, their objectives, and then translate that into the the documentation that we are going to prepare for them. Mm-hmm. Right. So co- coming to the last part where I want to kind of encapsulate what we've spoken about. Uh, the idea why we're doing this is because I feel like, um, like I shared with you, there's a lot of gatekeeping within the industry. I think in many industries as well, especially the creative industry, people are sharing the best, most beautiful part of what they can show, the facade, that face. But there are a lot of um, dark side, I would say dark side, but um, parts where I think we can shine a bit of light on in the industry. From your point of view, understanding being in legal, dealing with various industries, what would you say is something that we all should better know about 
in this industry and should take note of, you know, on, on top of like contracts? Is that something that is very important that people should know about? Mm. Well, I think um, understanding um, where you stand from a in terms of, of, of all your dealings is, is important. And I think um, uh, what we call as um, risk mitigation, right? Uh, risk will always be there. You know, you, you, you can't say that you, if you do business, you, 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 you must be ready for, for this agreement, which leads to dispute. So um, always uh, be prepared for that. Right. Uh, I, I think nobody wants to be in, 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 in situations, undesirable situations, but being prepared for it and um, allocating a certain budget for this, mm. right, uh, is, is important. It's, um, I always say this, like, like um, legal, being a lawyer sometimes, uh, the, the, the product that we try to sell is like a insurance. If nothing happens to you, uh, you will ask yourself, why am I paying for it every month, every year? Mm -hmm. But that one moment where you need to go to the hospital and the hospital bill comes out and it's completely covered by your insurance and then you'll be like, wow, I felt that that was worth it. And I think um, to the, a lot of people in the industry, um, yes, sales is important, marketing is important, a lot of budget goes to these things because they are they are considered as a revenue generating initiatives. Mm. Whereas legals legal is seen as a compliance cost. It's mm. a cost where uh, it's like sunk cost, right? Mm. But you know, see in another way. See it as uh, investing, right? Investing to prevent you from spending more when something happens, mm. right? Uh, Go back to the idea of prevention is better than cure, and I think you agree with me that uh, should should there be uh, better prevention, then I think the cost eventually uh, you you would rather pay upfront mm. lesser cost. It feels heavy at, at that time, but then you the cost of uh, a dispute or something going wrong, and then having someone to come and clean up the mess is always a lot higher. Mm. Yeah, so I think if anything, that's the parting message really that um, we we are not as lawyers. We are not interested to 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 come and uh, uh, just charge you for the sake of it. But um, we what we are trying to do, especially as a corporate lawyer, in coming up with all the documentation and advice from the start, not just the contract, but the advisory from the start, is so that at every stage you are you know that you are on the right path mm, right mm, mm, mm. and hopefully the right path mitigates a lot of the pain that you will be uh you you may go through right and and if if nothing happens then great i think uh i'll be very happy <laughs> the client should be very happy uh no one should hope that anything goes wrong but at the same time um i don't think you can ever deny the importance of having uh legal counsel on your side mm, mm. I think, yeah, appreciate how you're sharing this because uh, over the last one and a half year working with you and your team, right, made me realize that um, it changed my perspective um, looking at you guys because I always see having a lawyer on board is going on offensive all times, right? But this way you put it in a way it's not just being offensive but also yeah, preparing I, preventive measures. Yeah, right? no, I, 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 honestly, I think... Um, that's because uh, everyone's idea of a lawyer is like a, a court dispute lawyer, right? That, always, hey, paint, uh, always painted that way. Yeah, right? like I'm going to sue you, you know, like the American move, uh, shows and all, right? Or like suits, you know, they, they bang the door, come in, throw the file. But uh, actually, uh, I always see myself as uh, more of someone that facilitates, mm. um, uh, facilitates the transactions to go through smoothly. Uh, I see as myself as someone who protects my clients' interests, making sure that uh, they they get they get access to to, to good advice. Right, um, for example, I have a client who who pays me a retainer 
to 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 call me mm. whenever they need they need advice, and that's all they ask for, no agreement, no nothing, just purely advice. And I think for them they appreciate that, whenever uh, issue arise, uh, <coughs> they can speak to me and they can kind of stem the issue from the start, and that saves them money in the long run. So I think that that should be the mentality, and that's also something that we are trying very hard to raise awareness of, which is that, hey, you don't have to worry about speaking to to us, because uh, you don't only need to speak to us when something goes wrong. Yeah, mm. you know, like and 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 you can get counsel and advice from the start, and that's fine. That's something very valuable uh, of a lesson that I I picked up. You know that I kind of struggled internally mentally for like more than half a year through the 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 payments not being collected right sleepless night and all and then that moment when i you know reached out to you guys and then you sorted it sent out the first letter on behalf and subsequently you know letters come back back and forth right i i could actually sleep very well i was i think it's really about buying that peace of mind and knowing that you know there are many different perspectives we can look at things because when we are caught in that situation i myself everything gets very skewed everything is like laser focused into just the problem and never really see the problem from different perspective like i think that's something i appreciate you know you know working with you yeah yeah and i think uh you know we lawyers have uh, sleepless nights because we take on uh, our clients yeah yeah, you guys are like Absorbing problems of others. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's that's that that is a very good way of of of, of describing what a lawyer does, right? Which when people ask me, I say we are where people will take on other people's problems and make it ours and try our best to solve them for the clients so that they can focus on the things that they they want to do, right? Which is the business. Now, I don't think any business owners. Um, or any individuals uh, want to live their life going through court cases all the time, mm. going through disputes all the time. I think those those the time is better spent doing other things, uh, such as growing the business and uh, meeting your clients and and all the good stuff, right? Yep. Yeah, but unfortunately, bad stuff do happen, and when it happens, pass it on to the people who can uh, take it on for you, mm. and and don't just hold it in. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Just, just that last last piece of uh, emotion that we typically would feel is that when we feel like going aggressive, you guys will kind of hold our horses back and say, look, this is not the right move to take. Sometimes we are afraid to take um, action, but you think like, right, we got to do it right now, now and now, right? So I appreciate that, right? Yeah, so thank you for sharing. And uh, sure. I, I learned a lot throughout these two years, lah. You know, as one and a half years meeting you, right? And I think it feels there's a peace of mind, you know, when when you approach certain situation and knowing that okay, this one feels a bit red flag. What exactly should I do about this situation and all that? Yeah, thanks a lot, bro. No problem. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Uh, okay, and this. Thanks, man. Ah, awesome.